Welcome back to my channel, Culture Trekkers. Today, we're gonna jump right in and start talking about camera gear that I recommend for snorkeling, scuba diving, underwater photography. Um, I've been doing this for about three years now, specifically focusing on underwater photography and uh, scuba diving and creating videos, actually. So there's a few tips of the trade, I guess you would say, that I wanna go over, like what kind of gear you need, the filters, how to get smoother footage, doing the color correction, and all of those things. So it you can be a beginner or you can be an advanced scuba diver or videographer underwater, but it is a completely different ball game once you go from filming on land to filming under the sea. If you're new here, please subscribe, share with a friend, and hit that like button. Hi, I'm Janelle. I've been traveling internationally for the last 20 years, connecting with cultures and finding sustainable adventures, especially scuba diving. This year, I'm showing you my hometown of Utah, from the deep southern deserts to the high Uinta Mountains, with a sprinkling of hidden gems from around the world. Be sure to subscribe and become a part of the culture trekking community. Oh, and share it with your friends. The more the merrier. It isn't just about the camera gear though. Before you buy any camera gear, you need to make sure that you have your buoyancy um, all squared away, that you can actually do it and do it well, so that you're not destroying coral while you're trying to mess around with your cameras. You also need to make sure that you know your dive plan and that you have that communication with your dive buddy before you wanna start bringing gear down. But once you have those things in place and you've gone through about five to 10 dives without camera gear, um, then I would start getting into the filming and camera gear uh, when you're going to do this underwater and do the filming and photography. So be sure to check out culturechecking.com. I have a ton of information on tips and tricks to diving better especially if you are a beginner there's a few tips and tricks of the trade um, i'm in a landlocked state in utah and so these are things that i found very helpful from seasoned scuba divers who recommended doing these things the first one that i want to start out with is actually the gopro now the go this is the gopro hero 5 black i'll show you down here as well um, I really like the GoPro because it does have a lot of capabilities. Sorry, I have my dogs here, so in one of them's a puppy, a boxer puppy. Here's Finn. Um, so if you hear him heavily breathing or sniffing or shaking, that's my dog. <laughs> so back to the GoPro though. So this GoPro, I really like it only because it is easy, one touch, it's small, you can easily fit it under your wetsuit or just in the cusp of the wetsuit. Um, it's also very easy to fit in the pocket um, if you have a handheld device, which would literally be just one of these um, sticks that is a floaty thing uh, that you commonly get with the GoPro underwater rig. So if you wanted to go a step up, then I would go with this rig where it is in a bit of an upside down U shape. Some people hold it like this where you have the camera up on this side. I personally don't like that because then I can't get my light to swivel and twist because of this pole. Um, other people hold it like this where you can swivel this uh, light a little bit more um, to help with that backscatter and I know some people use their flashlight as well which is also super useful um, but this was my beginning rig uh, setup now this nut is a little bit loose only because I wanted to be able to twist it from side to side so you're not going to be able to capture really good sound on your GoPro because uh, it's going to pick up that swiveling and turning um, you do have to tighten it every now and then. Um, you can also move the camera. You can also move your diving rig um, or your diving casing from this position to this position, and then it will give you a little bit more room to swivel that light back and forth. 
Now, you do need to have a um, diving housing for your GoPro when you're going down. The reason is, is because as you get lower in depth, like to that 30, 60, 100 foot mark, um, water is going to seep in to the regular GoPro unless you have a protective housing around it. Another thing that you want to make sure you pick up are these little moisture wickers. Um, and I have all this gear and everything that you're going to need in the description box below, or you can go to kit dot co slash culture trekking and I have all sorts of adventure kits of all the gear I use everything that you're gonna need including beauty products in fact you just slip this or rather I usually slip this right underneath the GoPro but you want to put it in after you've put the GoPro in and then it just really fits snugly down on the side um, on the bottom or you can snug it in on the side. You just kind of have to Finagle it in a little bit. So see how that just slips in and then this flips over and You cinch it down. You want to make sure that this pops um, And that this is seated all the way down. Otherwise, you're gonna get water in there. Okay, now the last thing that I wanted to go over, for the GoPro rig at least, is the filters. So as you go down in depth, you're gonna lose different colors. The first color that you're gonna lose as you go down to depth is actually red, and then you lose orange, yellow, green, and blue. So having a filter that adds back in that red, or pink or purple, um, it's going to really help out your colors in your camera. So a good way to circumvent that is by using filters um, in these smaller, less expensive rigs like with the GoPro. Um, the picture quality of the GoPro isn't great to start with. I know with the higher models they're trying to work on that. Uh, but the video quality is pretty good as um, as a starter camera for underwater photography. So there's a couple of filters that you want to get, um, like this one. It's a pink filter. This one you would use probably no more than um, a 30 foot depth. Uh, just because as you get below that, you're going to want to switch over to this filter. This Sorry, it's a little dirty. Um, this deeper red filter. And then that's gonna bring in all your colors. The one thing I didn't like about these, um, I, it's, it's kind of a curse and a blessing in that it does have these uh, elastic um, attachments that you have to make sure are not in your photo. So what I do is I just wrap it around this a couple of times and then stick it on and then it's tight and it's when you're underwater it's not going to be floating in your picture you just want to make sure all your strings and things are not in front of your camera because the GoPro does shut off after a little bit and you want to make sure that as you're trying to film um, you're not always going to be able to see in the back of this camera which is why you want to make sure everything's nice and tight and tidy so this is usually how I hold it. I hold it close to my body so I'm a little bit more streamlined. I angle it out. Every now and then I will turn it off and then turn it back on um, and look and see where I need to position my camera. Now you're not going to be able to switch, well you will be able to switch between modes uh, right here on this button, right here. So you switch with modes here, you take the photos and the film here, and then you can see through the back here. Now if you do get water in your housing on the way down, or there's some kind of water bubble in front of the lens here, you want to make sure that you're putting water, that this is clean. Um, uh, you can open this housing before you get to that 30 foot depth and then um, make sure that the water is in uh, fully over the lens so that you don't get that bubble. 
The only other problem that I've had with a GoPro is when I'm in a really hot, humid environment, it can overheat. So make sure that you're keeping it in a cool area until you're going to be using it. Um, going from those different temperatures and depths, it is quite hard on the camera. So I would even have an extra GoPro with you just in case. So that's it for the GoPro. The next one I want to go to is the Sea Life camera. So this is the Sea Life camera and as you can see back here on this shelf, this is all of the stuff that I have for it. It is quite an expensive camera, um, even despite being so small like this, it does and is specifically made for underwater filming and photos. Um, they do, it does have different settings here for close-up, um, manual, panoramic, it, um, I usually shoot in the movie mode um, at 60 frames per second at 1080p. The higher end cameras, which we'll get to in just a minute, those are a lot more expensive, but this underwater camera is more for the budget, uh, moderate budget uh, folks. It does have a high resolution LCD screen, which stays on all the time, which makes it really easy to craft and frame your shot. Um, so there are different underwater modes with this. If you just go to the menu, you can change the photo size, the image ratio, um, you can change the maximum ISO, you can change the white balance, you can shoot in RAW and JPEG, um, and then they also have a setting for your lights where you can do an external light if you just have a flash, if you're snorkeling, or if you're diving. Because it has those different modes, it will adjust the coloring and have your filter in place or that red overtone for you. You can also shoot in shutter priority, you can shoot in aperture priority, you can change where you want the autofocus to be and a lot more settings that makes this a lot higher end camera but still affordable. Uh, just the camera itself, it's going to run you about, I think around $600. And then if you want the whole rig, uh, it'll cost you around $800 for different sections, $1,400 or $1,500, depending on the rig that you want. So when you get your camera, it's going to look like this if you get the whole housing. It does not come with this attachment. I'll talk about this in just a second, but it comes like this and then you open it up. It does have a seal on the inside so that your camera is protected. Um, this is where and why these camera rigs for underwater how and underwater housing start to get expensive because you have to be able to change the settings, especially if you're going to shoot in manual mode underwater. And so you see all of these little gears and things. This is what's going to help you be able to change those modes. This right here, this is actually a moisture, uh, they call it a moisture eater. And it's so that your camera doesn't fog up when you're at depth, when you go from those humid environments or areas around the ocean are humid. This is really good to have because as you go from a warm environment to a cold environment, you're naturally going to have that fogging of the lens. So the camera just pops right in here. And then you always want to make sure you have one of these moisture eaters in here. And then the camera just closes up. It locks like so. And then to unlock it, ladies, you can't, if you have nails, it's going to freaking break your nails. So use your worst nail to get it open. And then pops back open. Um, you never want to store your camera with this closed uh, because it's going over time to put pressure on this seal and then break that seal down and then eventually water would get in and your camera would be affected. This camera itself is not waterproof so you want to make sure that if you're going to buy this camera that you do get this housing with it so as you can see on the back here you can change different mode modes it is very easy it's just a press and um, 
press and hold, and then this is your enter button, and then you can change the different modes here. One thing that you want to make sure is that when you have, when you're going to switch modes from something like a panoramic or the movie or the photo, that you're actually have these two exactly the same on the outside as they are on the inside. That's a mistake I made when I was first setting this up. So you wanna make sure, so let's say, okay, so you can see here it's not on the fish mode. So I'm just gonna change this over to the fish mode. And then now we see that both of these are the same. So let's talk about this part. So this is what is going to attach to my it's um it's called a bcd or buoyancy control device and there are different loops and things on my bcd and so this one i actually have a ring that's just right at my hip that i connect this to and when i have this loaded up on the rig which i'll show you in just a second uh, it's very easy to just kind of hold it in between my legs and then um do my or let it hang between your legs like a dude you know and then <laughs> you just do your giant step into the water so very useful and then once I get underwater I can just go ahead and unclip this and then I can use uh, have this um, in my hands and not be worried about dropping it if I need my hands quickly for a life-saving purpose um, I can drop the camera but not lose it um, or if you're over an open ocean um, that's thousands of feet deep. So this is part of the rig and then I also have these that extend the, that attach down here and then extend these arms which I'll show you in just a second after I'm done explaining this and then this is another portion of my entire rig so you can see with all of this gear um, that it would be kind of difficult to manage all of that um, or all of this when you're trying to do your giant leap from the boat into the water and so that is why this becomes so important and you can just like i said get this from your local dive shop um or i'll try to find one online for you and then link it in the description in the one of the kits so these are two lights uh that I just am totally in love with because when you're filming or taking the photographs you're also as you go to depth you lose a lot of that light as well as color so to bring that back um, you need to have really good lights and if you're just with the GoPro a flashlight is uh, adequate for kind of those spot views um, but this will light up an entire area. And with these two lights, I really like this because you can, uh, once you have the ar extended arms on here, let me put them on for just a second. This is my rig. I love this thing so much. And then you can bend the arms. And the reason that I really suggest getting these extendable bendy arms um, is because just like when you're taking photos in with your flash on your camera into a mirror, you never want to do it straight on because the flash is going to come straight from the mirror back into the camera and have that flare. Whereas if you take it a little bit from the side and then you angle your camera, um, so instead of straight on, you angle it a little bit, um, the flash is actually going to bounce off the mirror onto you, but also give enough light for the camera to capture that image in the mirror without giving that weird flash um, or distorting your, your photo um, because of that flash. And you're able to see a lot more. Um, and that's the same kind of thing when you're diving. So you want to make sure that your uh, lights are offset far enough away from where your camera will be so that when the light hits the sand and the sediment, by adjusting these when you're down there, like so, looking through the back of the camera and seeing how it appears on film, um, it's going to create that 
uh, effect just like when you take your camera um, doing a selfie in the mirror with a flash and then it uh, the light will hit that sand and sediment and then it will um, it will help decrease the backscatter by how you position your lights when you're diving and it's really easy and that's why I really like this camera this camera is very good at macro photography and filming things really close up um, it does have quite a cropped view and so if you're doing filming you like to set the stage and that is why this is going to be important for you this is going to run you around 699 to $800 uh, depending on when you get it and where you get it but I'll put it up to the camera here so you can kind of see it has a really good view but it just opens up your view see that it gives you a little bit more around the edges so that you can um, set that stage or if you're uh, diving shipwrecks um, this is where that's going to be important uh, it is a little bit cumbersome to deal with when you're diving uh, only because it is what they call a wet mount so a wet mount is where you can attach this you attach this part this is the holder to the side of the rig here and then you attach this to um, that holder right here and it straps around right here and then as you're doing macro photography you come up on a boat and you want to do you know get that bigger picture and so you take it off of the holder and then you can put it onto your camera by just snapping it on um, because you're underwater it's going to be filled with water and so you're not going to get those bubbles like you would uh, with the GoPro if the water was seeping in. It works really well. The only thing that I have an issue with is that it does pop off quite easily. So when you're putting it on your camera, make sure you're really setting it in there. And then I actually left this on um, my camera and then would take it off if I wanted to do photography specifically. If and when I would ascend or come up to do my surface interval, I would, before I started to ascend, put the cover back on. I just don't like having too many things or gadgets, gadgets that you have to deal with um, when you're diving. The less you have to mess with, the more you're, the more safe you're going to be. And that's why I still will reiterate and go back to the fact that you need to make sure that you're experienced enough to go up to these higher rigs because they do require a lot more attention a lot more time and a lot more coordination when you're under the water so please keep that in mind don't put other people at risk or go past your no stop dive times um, or put your dive mask master at risk because you're trying to mess around with all this stuff okay it's just not worth it okay but if you are an experienced diver and you have a good attention to detail, you have mechanisms in place that can help you keep up to speed on both the safety and the enjoyment while capturing photos um, and video, then go for it. The high budget camera and housing I unfortunately do not have to show you because I can't afford it. <laughs> And I really doubt a lot of people can. Um, usually the, peop the people that have those end up being sponsored by some company or they're being hired by a company who can rent those out and or have them um, lent out on a trial basis. 
So basically the higher end housings and cameras is you would get a camera like this or a, uh, this is a Sony, you can get a Canon, you can get a Lumix G5. Um, if you haven't seen my last video on how to choose your camera gear, I talk about how Lumix G5 is really great for capturing video because it's one of the few cameras that does 4K at 60 frames per second, which is really important if you're filming underwater because at 60 frames per second on your camera settings, you can then slow that film down so that it, then it really gives you that smooth buttery footage. Um, it also has really quick settings on the back where like on this camera, it doesn't have it, but on the Lumix G5, you have like uh, C1, C2, C3, and then those are your white balance settings. Um, when you have that type of camera, you can take a white balance card, hold it out in front of you as far as you can get it, white balance it, and they will give you a perfect white balance every time when you're at those deeper depths. Unfortunately, the cameras that I've shown you here today, those don't have it. It's an auto white balance, which isn't as precise and kind of can throw your colors off and you will have to do a lot of correcting post edit if you're looking for the truest colors. So just keep that in mind. Um, but I'll show some footage throughout this video. I'm sure you've seen already. Um, it's adequate for my needs for right now. Uh, but with the higher end housings, um, you will have to keep up with maintenance of the, the silicone seals. Um, there are a lot, this, this one that I showed you on the Sea Life, it has one seal that's quite thick. If you get into these higher end cameras, the seals um, requ require um, a maintenance pretty much every few weeks to make sure that it doesn't lose that moisture that helps it seal the housing. Um, you also have issues with the gears or the areas around the gears that leak in. And when you have a camera um, that you've bought that's $1,600 to $2,500, you better know what you're doing with those housings or at least have someone that has educated you on those because otherwise water is going to get in here, humidity will get in here, and it's just going to destroy your, your fancy nice camera. So that's kind of why I have steered clear um, beyond the budget part of it uh, for those housings and then the higher end cameras just because I don't have a ton of extra money to replace a camera like the like my Canon um, that I'm filming on or my Sony you know it just it's not worth it to me but if it is for you then get into it uh, if, if this is a career that you want to have um, the only way to know is to try so get some insurance on your camera, try out, get those housings, get the camera, um, and, and try it out, you know, get the lights and everything. It's going to run you about 10 to 30 grand though. So just keep that in mind. Well, that's it for the underwater housings and cameras. If you have any questions, please drop them down below. All the kits and gear, I will leave a link um, at the kit.co slash culture trekking right here. And yeah. Thanks for joining. Make sure to subscribe, hit that like button, and share with a friend. Why not? More the merrier. <laughs> All right, guys. See ya.